What did I show you? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, okay, so if you're just now starting this video, the first part of the video is gone. Okay. So the video just crashed on me, which means the first part of this lecture and everything I covered for like the last hour is completely gone. <laughs> oh well. Um, well, if you are getting this video, I went through lectures three, four, and now I'm on number five. <laughs> so. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you want to show up to class is because when the video fails like it just did a few minutes ago, at least you heard the information. You don't have to rely upon something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I was talking about uh, when I when the video failed, I was talking about the uh, display actually at this point. I was talking about the OpenGL camera and the concept of the abstract camera that's being added to the scene that's giving us our positioning for the other objects. The positioning is terms of the flat, uh, this is, would be the flat default where the z is always equal to zero. It gives us a head-on view of the scene. It doesn't have to be. We can change it. We don't have to use the default view. And we can open up a scene by looking down a hallway. Or we can open up a scene by looking at the sky. or looking. Because if you think about it in our geometric scene that we're rendering, we could have objects on the top of the screen, the bottom. We could have a beach. We could have water. We could have all sorts of different objects. and um, the way that the objects are displayed is going to be in relationship to our ca camera angle and our view plane. So. Um, okay, so going through the rest of this here, the OpenGL primitives, we've actually seen all this stuff before. Um, the attributes, the RGB color, the index colors. This is a kind of a repeat of the lecture number three. So if you uh, missed this completely, because uh, you're watching the video and you didn't come to class, <laughs> then <laughs> or he just left. <laughs> lecture number three, I went through a lot of the stuff that has already been covered in lecture number three. So I'm telling this for the people who are watching the video. So now I'm talking to people who aren't sitting in front of me. So, which is interesting. Okay. So there. Um, actually, we looked at the smooth color already. Uh, but what I want to talk about today was I, you know, you missed the stuff on the graphic pipeline actually as well. So the pipeline, the rendering pipeline was also discussed in lecture number four. So. Uh, so viewpoints, do not use the entire window for the image. So they only use what's in the viewpoint. And talking about going back to the rendering pipeline, graphic pipeline that I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, we don't have to, if, if it's not going to be in the viewpoint, it doesn't need to be rendered. So it can cut down and streamline the processing and make the, make the pixel creation a little bit more effective. So, unfortunately... <laughs> Oh, we're still recording, which is interesting. Uh, that was number five. Uh, so, I hate it when technology fails. Technology has failed me. The third and last part for this evening of this particular part three, and this is I'm just basically telling you what's in here, is lecture number six. That's going to look at the three dimensions and define the three dimensional plane, which is. Uh, a little interesting. So the objective is to develop a more sophisticated three-dimensional example uh, using a factora as an example. And then uh, introducing hidden surface removal. I actually talked about the concept of hidden surface removal when I introduced the graphic pipeline a few lectures ago. Uh, so this is a continuation of that concept. So the three-dimensional applications. In OpenGL, two-dimensional applications are a special case of the three-dimensional graphics. It's a 3D graphic environment. So 2D is really a, a variation. So going to 3D, uh, not much changes occur. <laughs> so we use the GL Vertex 3. So we have to worry about the order in which the polygons are drawn or use hidden surface removal as a concept. So polygons should be simple, uh, convex, con convex and flat. So hidden surface removal is going to take away and not render surfaces that are not in the viewpoint. So the camera, if the camera is defined a certain way, we know what's hidden and we don't have to render that. So here's an example of our t 2D, uh, I don't know what that is, some sort of a gasket. Uh, you start with a triangle. You connect bisectors or sides and removal centers of triangle and you repeat it and you end up with uh, five subdivisions in this particular triangle as an example. 
So as a factorial, you consider the filled area is black and the perimeter of the length of the lines around the filled triangle. You continue subdividing, and the areas go to zero, but the perimeter goes to infinity. So it's not an ordinary graphic type of object. It's either nor 2D nor 3D dimensional. It's a factorial object. So our program to actually kind of do this would look something like this in terms of our gasket program, where we're just essentially representing the coordinate planes of uh, geo flow B vertices for an initial triangle and drawing the triangles. You can draw one triangle like this, essentially, uh, displaying one triangle, A, B, C, three points of the triangle. And you can subdivide the triangle. This is the code that would actually kind of create that image that we just looked at before. It's a flat image. Display the triangle. Run through the main function. As we saw before, the window, the mode. This is pretty generic code. You can take it from the hello world. And then we have an efficiency note. So by having the GL begin and the GL end in the call display callback rather than in the function of the triangle, and using the GL triangles rather than the GL polygons in the GL begin, we can call the GL begin and call the GL end only once for the entire gasket rather than once for each one of the triangles. So depending upon which technique you're using, are you drawing the polygon or are you drawing triangles to create the polygon? Depends on how many times the begin and the end is going to happen. That basically starts our rendering. So the rendering starts with the begin, ends with the end. So it basically tells us how efficient. So we can render it all at once or we can render it individually. Rendering it individually is more time consuming. <laughs> Rendering it all at once is faster. So moving into 3D, we can easily make the, tri the, the program three-dimensional by using the GeoFlow V, the 3.3 vertex, and then creating a viewpoint. This is our camera, actually, our, ortho, our GL ortho, which is giving us our Z is equal to zero default viewpoint. Uh, but that would be very interesting. Instead, we're going to start with a texahedron. I'm going to start with a different one. So. We can set, because actually if we drew that two-dimensional and the three-dimensional, um, it's going to look two-dimensional. Let's draw a three-dimensional one, so we can subdivide each one of the four triangles. So it appears uh, if we remove the solid tetrahedrium from the center, leaving four smaller ones in here, and we've got a little bit more sophisticated three-dimensional looking gasket. Here's an example after five iterations. We've got each one of the iterations is drawing more triangles inside of the triangles. Here's our triangle code, subdividing code, our code for the texahedrium. Almost correct. So we get this, we want that. Eh, just slightly. Actually, it looks pretty good. I can't even tell the difference. But Because uh, the triangles are drawn in the order, they are defined in the program. The front triangles are not always rendered in the front of the triangles behind them. Ah, good note to actually kind of say, depending upon how you're rendering the image and building it, you're going to get different results <laughs> uh, because of the, of the way that the image is rendered. So it has to do with the, uh, the order in which the right triangles are rendered. So let me give you a formal definition of this hidden surface removal. We want to see only those surfaces in front of the other surfaces. We don't care about the ones that are underneath. So OpenGL uses what's called a hidden surface method called a z-buffer algorithm that saves the depth information as the, as the objects are rendered so that only the front objects appear in the image. Because if we don't need the data, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be saving it and we shouldn't be using it. Because uh, one thing is going to essentially overwrite another thing. And so we can just essentially um, display the overridden material, essentially. So it's called a z-buffer algorithm. In terms of using the z-buffer algorithm, we don't actually have to write it. We just call it function. <laughs> we say, apply hidden surface removal. Algorithm uses an extra buffer, the z-buffer, to store depth information. It's this is as the geometry travels down the pipeline, as we've seen from the pipeline example. It will store the information, calculate, well, what's going to be shown, and get rid of everything else, which makes it more efficient. So we must be uh, requested in main, so we run it in it display mode, and then uh, let depth, RGB, single, enabled in init, the depth test, and cleared by the callback, the buffer bit, so clear, clear back, or excuse me, clear off the buffer information. So the Z buffer 
is nothing more than the, the Z plane rendered and then removed, cleared out of the buffer. So, and then we don't have to worry about it. Basically, we're just not processing it. So we have surface versus volume subdivision as another example. So in our example, we divided the surface into faces. We can also divide the volume using the same midpoints. So the midpoints define the four smaller tetrahedrons for each one of the vertices, uh, vertexes, keeping only the ones that we're removing of volume. So see the text for code. This is actually in the red book. There's a text. There's the code for this, uh, which is what this lecture is based on. So the red book is going to have the code that's going to be uh, for this. And then this situation it looks like this, the subdivision. It just gives us a different effect. This is to apply. This looks kind of Christmassy, actually, <laughs> now that I look at it. So. Well, that was on our agenda for today. Our seventh one is going to go into a totally different topic that I'm going to take at a slower pace. It's going to be the input and the interaction. So next week, we'll focus on event-driven behavior, and the interaction of the uh, uh, using the mouse events. And I'm going to have some examples for you uh, next week for controlling the mouse, the keyboard. Uh, and uh, if I think about it, I have to go look for my timer examples. But uh, it will be on I.O. And I think, I think I'm also probably going to cover uh, some basic concepts of color and lighting as well. It depends on what's in the chapter. It depends on what is in the lecture 8. I have to go download it. But uh, we have gone through, don't save, <laughs> we have gone through the, uh, it's kind of irritating. We've gone through the uh, ones I wanted to get through, which were 4, 5, and 6, which are a lot of overlap, a lot of repeat from what we've already seen. So. Oh yeah, and for those of you who missed the first part of the video, you missed the midterm exam. The midterm exam, I have to repeat this, is posted on bhacker.com, take home midterm exam, and the midterm exam, I, I, you missed it, but I went over it. You can go over it on your own. It is going to show you uh, five questions. You answer all five questions is due on 12-12, as a reminder, for those of you who actually heard it the first time. Uh, you answer all five questions. The questions can be answered with source code or they can be answered with text. So uh, it's up to you. Um, 150, 200 words, you don't have to write a novel for each one of them. If you do this assignment, which is the midterm exam, if you do it before, um, before you do the assignments, you might find the assignments to be a little easier. Uh, the other deliverable, which I don't have available yet, is the CSLO essay. We have one more item as well. Let me just take a quick look at the syllabus so you can sort of see, put this into perspective here. And I mentioned before, when the video before, the part that's missing from the video, <laughs> I pointed out that we have the final exam is 25%. The CSL essay, which is 25%. The final exam probably multiple choice, I believe. The assignments are 25 and the midterms are 25. So if you can't do the assignments, it's a very small percentage of the course, as you might see. There are five of them, <laughs> which is a lot of work. So what I was mentioned at the beginning of the course, which did not get recorded, was that you can give it your best effort. They don't have to be fully functioning programs. Try as close as you can to get them done. Submit something. You'll probably get full credit for it. So it's not. I'm not going to nitpick the assignments because the assignments are a lot more difficult than the five points, but that's how you're going to learn the material, essentially. You're not going to learn anything from the take-home midterm exam. You're not going to probably learn anything from the CSLO. And the CSLO will be an essay. It won't be, a, won't be related to it. will be something about graphics, <laughs> to write a two- or three-page report on something graphic-related. So, And maybe I'll have that ready next week. I'll have to remember. So. Uh, questions, comments? No? Are we good? We good on time? Yeah, good on time too. Okay, dokie, we're done for tonight then. This huge class. <laughs> well, that's one of the 